Hi. Um, in the Middle Ages, the written word belonged almost entirely to the church. It was in the control of the church. And then the printing press was invented. The written word was liberated. Mass communication began. And, um, oops, oops, oh, I've gone a bit too far on that. No, I haven't gone far enough on that. Sorry, I've got a, an interesting connection here. It seems that my... Yes, good. Okay. Um, yes, the printing press was, was invented and mass communication came. The written word was liberated and knowledge was democratised. It entirely changed society, turned it upside down. And we're pretty much in the middle of a very similar kind of, of revolution. Um, in the words of John Luke Gott, up until, sorry, up until very recently, um, in the words of John Luke Goddard, the French New Wave filmmaker, the moving image, that most powerful of communication tools, was locked inside the fortress industry. The equipment to make film was expensive and pretty cumbersome. Would you like to just have a, a feel? <laughs> Whoop. Um, and you needed big money and uh, big crews in order to make even the simplest of films. Now, of course, all of us, you and me, we can make high definition films with multi-track sound, with uh, sophisticated special effects, and we can distribute it within minutes around the world. Um, and so the fortress has been stormed, and the uh, moving image has um, been liberated. When you, move, when you connect the moving image, that most powerful communication tool, with reality, you're doing something even more powerful. You're saying, this is real. You're putting on the screen a reflection of the world around us, and it can be incredibly influential. And the first clip I'm going to show in a minute um, is a clip of a film that I made with a very brave group of women in Zimbabwe called Waza. The word means come forward in, in, in Dabili and, and Zulu. And um, their slogan was, the power of love can overcome the love of power. You have to think about Zimbabwe at the time of 2008, was the run up to the elections there. And it was a society, it was a very, very um, tough life in Zimbabwe. The unemployment figure was 80%. And the only kind of moving image that people could see, <coughs> most of the population could see, was state propaganda, um, which carried images of lavish um, spectacles with leaders being adored by the population and lots and lots of blatant propaganda that was designed to frighten people. It was um, sort of rhetoric against oppositions, rhetoric against any kind of dissent. And the, the regime maintained power by um, instilling fear. The film that we made uh, was designed to neutralize that fear. So if we can have a look at that now. With plans for tomorrow's action in place, members will now return to their communities to continue mobilizing. Our office, Say Waza, is in the street and it's there that the most important work is done. Get this thing to 
Kenyan police would be amazed later to see when you saw these women, they were working, these men were working, but they were not killing anything, certainly they had black cards, roses, and cards, and everything. Today, I will take it as a day for us to show to the people that we are working towards our problems. If those in the parliament, the senators, and the president support to protect the very best of them, it's different from us, is it right? So the people in the position. So they are supposed to protect their city. It's more about the food and the land. That's why we women, we are always on the roads. Get it from our suffering. I'm not afraid. And I can do it. I'm brave enough. The blow of your Valentine's action has been a success. While onlookers cheered, the police stood on the sidelines and there were no arrests and no beatings for Waza this time. People were looting today. People yeah, were just looting. Yeah, people were running to the death and to ask for roses. Oh, oh, what was important in making that film, and the reason why I was so interested in making it, was that we were putting on the screen that in that time, in that place, was reserved for a ruling elite. We were putting the people themselves on the screen. And it had a powerful impact because they saw themselves not as oppressed victims. They saw themselves as confident citizens making a critique on their government and outwitting the authorities. It was terribly important for democracy to have that process of taking possession, repossessing, if you like, the screen. Nowadays, um, we, over here in the West, we can do just about everything. We, you know, we don't have those kind of constraints. Um, but our media is still controlled to a fairly large extent by the, the world of commerce. Uh, we still have... Um, the broadcasters are still sort of bound by the ratings wars, by the imperative to uh, get um, advertising revenue. We ourselves, we are liberated, and we can make and watch whatever we like. Uh, so it's quite an interesting, it's quite a, an important thing. And as a documentary filmmaker, I like to seek out the alternative voices. So one of the films I made, and just to give you an example of that, uh, it was a very short film. It's a, about the arms fair that was held in London uh, in November last year. And um, it was made showing that the people outside the arms fair and what they were saying. So an alternative voice to some, the arms trade is a important asset to economics. To others, it's a pretty much a criminal um, enterprise. Uh, but it's important that we can see both sides. Uh, so if we have the next clip. Oops. Into a giant composting system. There's a burden pulsating in a 
energy shooting through the cracks of a shattering system. Seeds of change and germination. Here at Ground Zero, indignation solidified. A population galvanized. The 99 personified. We've come to talk about what's going down. Camped out, new fields of possibilities. We meld that become one body, solded by the ten pegs of love and solidarity. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. to the brink of extinction. We're gonna get Darwinian, armed with information and critical discussion and spreading of the advancing Sahara bearing ten poles and a sense of humour. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. He's Spartacus. Sir, so, an alternative voice. Um... Oops. Right, sorry, I'll just find the side that I've got on my screen. <laughs> That's the one. Uh, okay. Um, when you put reality on the screen, there is a lot going on. And I rather like this quote from uh, John Corner. He's a theorist on, on documentary filmmaking. We who cut, weave, edit, splice, crop, sequence, interpolate, interject, connect, pan, come up with our captions and comments, have our say wherever and however, have thereby linked our lives to those we have attempted to document, creating a joint presentation for an audience that may or may not have been asked to consider all that has gone into what they're reading and viewing. Um, I'll just check whether that works. We're not ready for that yet. Uh, that process of making film, especially when you're dealing with reality, carries a huge amount of responsibility. And in Voltaire's words, with great power <coughs> comes great responsibility. And indeed, I had an experience of, of what that actually means as a film, for a filmmaker uh, when I made a film about torture. I met a man, a human rights lawyer, Gabriel Shumba, who had come within a hair's breadth of being tortured to death and he was a very elo eloquent man so I made the film based p mainly on his testimony on what he the story that he told but nevertheless I had to do some cutting the interview was an hour and a half long and that was just too long for that kind of subject matter in, in film form so I had to cut how my dilemma was how was I to make a transition from one section to another? What do you put on the screen when you're talking about torture? It was a real dilemma. I, I found a way uh, that worked with this particular film, I think, and so you'll see how in the first part of the film, how Gabriel's um, extreme eloquence really carried the viewer, and of course the story he was telling, carried the, the, the viewer well enough so that there wasn't a need for extra uh, visuals and then you'll see how I did manage to make the transition when I did have a transition to make. Um, his story is quite um, upsetting, if I could just warn you. So if we can have the next film please. claimed tight on the wire so I, I held tight and one was also holding me by the mouth then they switched on the electricity um, the blast was such that um, I never experienced such pain in my life it's indescribable I could hear the electricity you know as if my hair is standing then inside my brain I could here some something like a hammer you know hitting against the inside of my brain like this increasing speed tremendously you know like beginning slowly ka, 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 then ka, 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 ka. so i couldn't even then open my mouth so
so I could feel that my mouth was closed tight and the guy had let go of my of my mouth, the guy who had been holding my mouth closed as well. I could feel that my eyes were open, but I assumed that what was happening was that, because uh, I could feel that they were bulging, in fact, out of their socket, but I couldn't see anything. So I think maybe they, are, they were white, you know, like, then I was spasmodic, you know, going, wee, 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 wee. So it was, you know, such pain that uh, I, I really failed to, 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 to get around to describing how it was, but it suffices to say that um, this went on for about two minutes and I could hear myself screaming, but my mouth was not open. You know, I don't know how that uh, scenario can happen, as well as feel cold and hot at the same time. I know it's very difficult to imagine, but it's possible to feel cold and hot at the same time, simultaneously. I could feel, you know, that kind of then sweat was pouring over me when I came to, after they switched off. They switched it off all of a sudden that I was in the, you know, in the motion of, of, of you know, trembling like that. That I fell completely over me, like a somersault with all those, you know, the, the plank, the plank between my, my handicap, the hand, but I sort of rolled over and I let loose a scream. That was when I managed to open my mouth, but all along I, I had been screaming inside my head. I could hear the scream. I said, ah! I said, you kill me. I only managed to recover my voice after about, I think about five minutes. They waited for me patiently, like, you know, vouchers all by two. Under that vicious torment, I, I uh, eventually lied. Disturbing stuff. And you can see how I uh, was reluctant to use images with that. But there are filmmakers who have chosen to use images, um, to use reality in, in, that, in, in a certain way, to use spectacle in a way that I think is very dangerous. Um, for example, there's this film, Taxi to the Dark Side. Uh, and it's a film which tells the story of the murder of an Afghan taxi driver who was beaten to death by American soldiers while in uh, extrajudicial detention. It was... It's important to expose injustice, but in this film it used the same trophy recordings that the um, abusers themselves had made. There were sequences of sexual taunting, of terrorizing with dogs, waterboarding, and then the trailer, and this is a, a clip from the poster, was even worse. Using these same images uh, in the sort of slick, come and be entertained way of any um, film trailer. And there is a point where spectacle and reality just don't mix. We do need to know these things. Um, Errol Morris is another filmmaker who was quite happy to use spectacle uh, in his film, uh, which was a, a blockbuster documentary, Standard Operating Procedure. And it's another example. It's a provocative inquiry into the prisoner's abuse scandal at Abu Ghraib. But what makes it most provocative is that its greatest ambition is for its own visual style. What happens when we use reality in this way? This? It's a difficult world. The world of... I'll take that off the screen now, thank you. Um, it's a difficult world, the world of, of reality and bringing reality to the screen. But one of the things that happens is we tend to see around us a reality full of extremes full of the spectacle and of the drama. Um, so I thought I'd like to finish with a film that I made about a quiet, small reality just down the road from where I live. And we have the last one.
many occasions I've had uh, mostly youngsters come in. They come in and say, well, how much do you want for those two old chairs you've got up there? And when I tell them they're not for sale, they're quite shocked. I've been there forever. And he's a very nice man, and his chairs are made to last. Yes, you put in here, them here from years, darling, years. Oh yes, I've been here 30 odd years, and I've been here, I suppose, before. A lot of people do look at you and say, oh, this is no I think some people are reluctant, because they're not sure whether they're allowed to, but yes. Only a few times. You never sit there? No, no, no. Well, one day I was standing out here and Louis came and said to me, Oh, sit down, my day, it's for you. The age. Yes. The old idea began quite a few years ago. Uh, where the bus stop is outside, there used to be a, a glass uh, shelter in front of it. So I started putting them up against the back and the shelter. What people, as there was no seats available for people to sit down, they used to sit on them. But then there came a time when the bus shelter, they took the petition away that I could put them up. So I was left with putting them in front of in front of the shop, in front of the furniture. And that's it. Thank you very much.